I'm so, so I'm not sorry. Actually, I'm really not sorry. They should be sorry. I'm so serious. Like this is the death of writing. The writing is dead. It's dead. Hello, hi, welcome everyone. If you know me at all, even in the slightest bit, you know that my favorite TV show of all time, more accurately, my favorite piece of media of art of all time is Avatar The Last Airbender. I grew up watching that TV show from the day the first episode aired until the series finale. I watched all of it live. I have rewatched that show more times than I can count. It is my favorite thing ever. I love that show with my whole being. So as you can imagine, when the live action adaptation was announced on Netflix, I was very hesitant, but also excited to see what would happen, what they would do with the show. Well, we finally have a trailer and we have a release date. The show is officially being released on February 22nd on Netflix. And in the past couple of weeks, I guess the actors have been doing like a press tour to promote the show before its release. And there are some things that have been said, some choices that have been made. And I just, I need to talk about them. We have to talk about them because this is so important to me. I need a space to complain. Hence the purpose of my platform. <laughs> like I said, the trailer is out. I have seen it, but I watched it like the day it dropped. The morning I woke up half delirious. I wasn't like fully paying attention. So I do want to watch it again, just so I can take some more of it in. I had some initial thoughts, but I do want to watch it again. So we'll watch it together. And then we'll dissect these press releases that have been coming out and the um, changes they're supposedly making to the TV show that I, I have so many thoughts, so many thoughts about this. So we'll dive in. Before we get into the rest of the video, I do quickly wanna to thank today's sponsor, which is Book of the Month. Book of the Month is a book subscription service that sends brand new hardcover books to your door. Every month they create a curated list of books for you to choose from to make it easy to decide on your next read and you get to pick your favorite one and they send it straight to you. It's a great way to discover what books you'd like to read next and also to save money on the books you read because one of my favorite things about Book of the Month is their incredible pricing. They've also launched an audiobook format as well, so so if you prefer to read in an audiobook format, you can choose the audiobook for that month instead of a physical book, and I just think that that's a fantastic addition. They focus mostly on debut authors and up-and-coming authors, but they also have some well-known and established authors as well. So let me show you the two picks that I have for February that I was really interested in. First up we have The White Fox. This is a novel set in 1908 in Manchuria. It's a story about ancient folk tales as well as like a murder mystery from what I understand. It seems to be a lot about myth and fairy tales and folk tales and stuff and I absolutely love those types of stories so I'm very excited to try this one out. And my second pick is Neighbors and Other Stories. This is a short story collection published by the author Diane Oliver who passed away in 1966 and this is the first and only collection of her short stories in one single book. She wrote a lot of stories set in Jim Crow era America and I have just heard fantastic things about her writing and I'm just so excited to try this out. I love short story collections so I'm very excited to read this. So if you're interested in trying out book of the month for yourself. For a limited time, you can join and get your first book for just $9.99 with my code SMOOCH. The link and code are in the description box below as always. And thank you again to book of the month for sponsoring today's video. So let's dive in, shall we? First up, I want to start with watching the trailer. So let's watch this together, then we'll debrief, and then we'll get into everything else because there's so much to cover. <laughs> All right, I've got my headphones in. I'm ready to start. I have my Oppa plushie for emotional support, <laughs> as well as my office sweatshirt. You know, I really just brought out all my Avatar merch today. <laughs> okay, let's begin. The Fire Nation is embarked on a dark path. And the world might never recover. There goes the savior of the world. Oh, I don't like that font. <laughs> don't like that font. I chased down every hint of the Avatar. It's my destiny. Why does Zuko's scar just look like a bad bruise. <laughs> Did they learn nothing from the movie? Do we not understand how burns work? Okay, it's okay. I'm really trying not to be a hater. Okay, like I don't want to dislike this, but we'll get we'll get it we'll get into it. Okay, we'll get into it. I could really end up liking this later, and I could totally eat my words. The fire ending doesn't look too bad. Tara and a flying ball of fur. What more do you need? Yeah, I'm not sold on Sokka. I'm sorry. Fighting for. Is that supposed to be Zhao? The ones okay, Omashu looks pretty good. I don't love Appa. <laughs> I don't love that CGI. Oh, Boomy! Okay, the Avatar State animation doesn't look bad.
Okay. I have such mixed feelings watching that trailer because there are like elements of it that I genuinely really like. Like it actually looks good. The music is obviously the same, but you know, embellished a little bit for this version of it. And I like it, like it feels somewhat genuine, but there are some, some things that already kind of stand out. Like I said, don't love Zuko's bruised eye makeup not a fan of that like you want to make an actual burn scar make a burn scar like that's not a burn scar it's giving dev patel in the movie version it's not good second thing i don't love is um sokka's actor not sure that i'm really sold on him it is just a trailer we only did get a few scenes but it was really flat so i don't know how well that's gonna come across i feel like katara and ang's actors look pretty good, like they look pretty accurate. They look like children, which they should, and I appreciate that. I don't know how I feel about some of the CGI. Some of it looks really good, like the cities looked great. Omashu looked fantastic, I really liked that. Some of the bending looks really good. I don't know how I feel about Appa. Appa looked a little like movie Appa, like some weird scary creature. <laughs> the main thing I feel when I watch this is this one tweet that I saw a while ago where someone was like, this would look so much better animated. <laughs> And that's exactly how I feel because we know it would. I've always been hesitant and skeptical about a live action adaptation of this show because I just, I don't feel like it needs a live action. It translates perfectly in animation. I feel like that was the perfect medium for a show like this. Um, and I just don't see why we need a live action version. But, you know, if we're gonna do it, so far visually, I'm not upset. I'm not mad about that. I watched this the first time and I was like, okay, I don't have too many thoughts about it, but I'm not as disappointed as I expected to be. The way I was feeling about this show when it was first announced was extremely hesitant, but also extremely excited because the original creators of the show, Brian and Mike, also known as Brike, were still working on the show. They were working with Netflix on the show, but mid-production, they announced that they were leaving because of creative differences. And ever since they announced they were leaving, I had no faith in this show whatsoever. I knew that there was definitely some major conflict, some major reason, something that was going to fundamentally be different in this show from the original series that I would agree with the creators on that I wouldn't like about this. Like there had to be a serious reason why they left because I don't trust many original creators of shows and things, but I do trust Brike because they knew what they were doing with Avatar. And I feel like they've held on to the integrity of that show very, very well. They really deeply care about the message of that story. So I knew that if they were leaving this show mid-production, after being really excited about it and really enthusiastic about it, I knew that we were gonna have some problems. <laughs> Again, the trailer, not, uh, not all that disappointing. I'm glad that they actually cast kids. That was the thing that I was so worried about. One, them, first of all, them like actually being uh, people of color was a big concern for me. Like I thought they were just gonna cast all white actors <laughs> and basically do what they did with the movie. But then also I was worried that they wouldn't make them children. And I'm really glad that they did. Like they look like kids because they are, and they should, because that's the whole point of this story. Like the fact that they're children, the fact that they're genuinely so young going through all of this and experiencing all of this is such a significant aspect of the story. It's such an important integral part of the message of the story as well. So um, yeah, I'm really glad about that part of it at least. I don't think it's perfect casting. I don't think that they cast indigenous actors to play most of the Water Tribe people, so that's not my favorite, but you know, I really, I don't expect much from them in the first place. So this is more than I was anticipating already. But now we have to get into dissecting these absurd press tour stories that are coming out, um, these supposed changes that are being made in the series, and I'm upset, oh, to say the least. <laughs> So basically, if you don't know, if you haven't kept up, um, a bunch of like film and TV accounts were publishing um, these quotes that were coming from articles about the new series, um, some of the stuff that the actors were saying on the press tour, some of the stuff the directors and um, writers and stuff were saying about the changes and things that they've decided to make in the new live action series. So these were all coming out in the last week, last few days or so, and I have just had them on my mind so much. I just, I can't stop thinking about these because what do you mean? What do you mean they're not gonna have Aang go on as many detours during the show and he's just gonna have a quote vision of what's going to happen and he says I have to get to the Northern Water Tribe to stop this from happening. What do you mean? <laughs> so basically they're saying no little detours, no little stops, none of the like fun elements of the show, the fact that they go on these little adventures from episode to episode before they get to the Northern Water Tribe. They're gonna try and skip over a lot of those and go just like as directly to the Northern Water Tribe as possible because they're gonna give Aang a vision 
that he just has to go there immediately. Did you not watch the original series? Did you miss the point of those detours? Because I think you did. There's a very intentional reason why Aang goes on so many detours from the very beginning of the show. He is very actively avoiding the shame and guilt that he feels about abandoning his people and his position as the Avatar by distracting himself and avoiding his feelings and his emotions and that conflict by going on these little adventures. That's an essential part of his character and who he is as a person. And it's something that he grapples with and comes to terms with and deals with throughout the show. Like it's part of his arc as a character. He needs to avoid these things until he's forced to confront them. And then he has like a whole breakdown about it. He tells Katara, he confesses to her that he left, he abandoned being the Avatar, and now he feels all of this shame and feels all of this guilt. If we don't make him go on the detours, what, how are we gonna get to that point? Are you just gonna have him out of nowhere be like, actually, I was supposed to be the avatar, but I didn't want to be the avatar. I didn't want this power. I didn't want that responsibility. Like they keep saying in the trailer, I'm so worried that that scene's just gonna come out of nowhere. He's just gonna be like, I don't want this responsibility and just cry out of nowhere without us having like earned that emotional release. Do you know what I mean? Um, it's giving lazy writing. It's very much giving lazy writing. Again, we don't know. They could just be saying things to cause like drama, cause controversy before the show comes out so people talk about it. And then once it's released, they actually did exactly what the show did originally. Who knows? I trust nobody at this point. Um, but I don't know why you'd be saying all of this before the show comes out because you're kind of digging your own grave at this point. There's also another very intentional purpose to having Aang go on all of these detours because that's one of the reasons that Zuko has such a hard time finding him. There's literally that whole scene in the show where Zuko pulls out that map and he's trying to track Aang and he says he's clearly a master of evasive maneuvering or something like that. And then it immediately transitions into Aang being like, let's go ride the elephant koi or wherever they're going in that episode. It's a significant part of why Zuko has such a hard time tracking him down. It adds to Aang's character so much. You see his playful side, you see that he's still such a child. He thinks like a child and he behaves like one and he has the emotional maturity of one because that's what a kid would do. They would avoid their responsibility like that by just going around and trying to have fun in order to avoid their feelings. And I feel like if you take that out of it, it's gonna dull down Aang's character so much. I feel like he's gonna be really boring in this. And I think one of the most endearing things about Aang is the fact that he's so childlike, the fact that he's so playful. And I feel like if you just take that out, it kind of just makes him one of those like bland, ordinary heroes. Again, who knows? Who knows? We could watch it and it could end up being okay. It could end up being fine. They may find some other way to add some of that playfulness back into his character. But like, I don't know, I just really feel like that's an important, an important essential part of the story. And it worries me. That was the first piece of news that really worried me. The second one, I have even more issue with. Like this first one, I can maybe, maybe forgive. The second one though, Oh my god. So this was the thing that really, I don't want to say set me over the edge because something else fully set me over the edge, but this was the thing that like halted me in my tracks and I was like, oh no, they don't understand what they're adapting. They don't understand good writing. They don't understand <laughs> the point of this show or anything about it really. And that is that they've decided to take out some of the sexism from Sokka's character, like some of the sexist and misogynistic things that he says. I saw this tweet from Variety. There are a number of tweets, but this is just the one that I have saved for now. It says the Netflix live action Avatar, the last airbender series is toning down the sexism. We took out the element of how sexist Sokka was. I feel like there were a lot of moments in the original show that were iffy. Yeah, totally. There are things that were redirected because it might play out a little differently in live action. What do you mean? <laughs> I'm so, so I'm not sorry. Actually, I'm really not sorry. They should be sorry. The creators of this show, the writers of this show. This I feel like is just a problem online. This goes back into the death of media literacy and uh, critical thinking skills and like literary analysis. There is a difference between depicting something and condoning something. Nothing in the original Avatar The Last Airbender series condones any of the sexism in the show. Making Sokka say sexist and misogynistic things at the beginning of the show is so incredibly intentional for his character, first of all, because he literally says these things, he has these beliefs, and then he has to unlearn those beliefs and then grow and change as a person. 
it teaches you a lesson through his character in a very, very clear arc, okay? It's so intentional, and nobody with a brain who watched that show came away from it thinking, no, actually, he was just, like, really sexist, and it was bad, and we should just take that out. What do you mean? <laughs> It's there for a reason. It's there, especially in a children's show, to teach you something. I promise you so many kids growing up watching that show at an early age, like I was like seven or eight years old or something watching that for the first time, so many kids who grew up watching that learned about sexism and how it's wrong through that specific experience with Sokka. So I don't understand what anyone is thinking saying that there was sexism in the show that needs to be toned down. There is sexism in that universe for a reason, and they deliberately counter that sexism. They give you an opposing view to show you that that's wrong. What are they gonna do with him and Suki? Like, what is gonna be the whole point of the Kyoshi warriors? Are they not gonna have him become a Kyoshi warrior and have Suki tell him that girls can do anything he can do too and beat him up a little bit? What's the whole point of the scene where they first meet the Kyoshi warriors then? Well, like, tell me what you're gonna do with that scene. It's gonna be so boring and so meaningless. And it's not just essential for Sokka's arc specifically. It's also incredibly essential for the universe. First of all, the reason that Sokka and Katara find Aang in the iceberg is because Katara is yelling at her brother for being misogynistic, and it literally causes her to waterbend and break the iceberg that frees Aang. So if she's not yelling at her brother for being annoying and sexist, how are we gonna break Aang out of the iceberg? Because that was an iconic scene. Maybe it's because some of these people did not grow up watching this show or did not grow up with it, or just maybe they just didn't watch it at all. But there was a huge impact having an animated children's TV show in 2005 depict the main female character in the first scene, one of the very, very first scenes of the entire series, yelling at her older brother for being sexist and irritating, and that being the reason that she frees the Avatar and gains her power, literally gains her power from calling him out for being sexist. Tell me how that makes the show or Sokka's character or anything have too much sexism? I, I just, like, you'd have to be intentionally misreading that in order to interpret it that way. And then also, tell me what this means for uh, Katara's fight with Master Paku. If we're toning down the sexism, unless they just mean within Sokka's character, which is already absurd, but if they're toning down the sexism in the universe, does that mean that Master Paku isn't gonna refuse to teach Katara waterbending? Because that misogyny is embedded in the water tribe culture. It's like a part of it. It's something that Katara has to face and deal with, and not just Katara, Toph also has to face this and deal with it later. All of the women in this show face this. Suki and the Kyoshi warriors being different from a lot of other warriors because women aren't seen as warriors in a lot of other cultures like the Fire Nation or the Northern Water Tribe. Toph faces a lot of sexism and misogyny within her own family, her family thinking that she's just a young, frail girl so she could never be a fighter, and her overcoming that. Katara overcoming that with Paku and the Northern Water Tribe, and proving to all of them that she's just as strong as the rest of them. And Azula as well deals with a lot of the same misogyny and sexism. That's a barrier that all of the women in this show face, and I think it was written into the show very intentionally. They are some of the most incredibly written, most fleshed out female characters in anything I've ever watched or read or seen. And there is no possible way to interpret any of that misogyny that you see in the show or any of that sexism as genuinely sexist. Like, it is so obviously put in there on purpose so that the show can counter it. You just know, you just know that they don't understand what they're making and they, they didn't watch the source material. Like you clearly didn't watch the source material. And maybe you watched episode one and then skipped to Paku telling Katara that because she's a woman, she can't fight and then like didn't watch anything in between or after. I swear to God, that's the only way that you could possibly interpret it that way. Anyway, so I'm upset about that. The other thing that I'm upset about was there was another um, tweet article thing. There were quotes from it. It about how they want to again tone down some of the like gender issues with Katara's character and from what I understand about this it seems like they're saying that they think that they don't want her to be as motherly of a figure in this story in this version of the story which again absurd. That is actual sexism. That is actual misogyny. Because basically what you're saying is that either she has to be womanly and a mother or she has to be a good fighter and like a, a warrior. She can't be both at the same time. And that was the whole point of Katara's character. That's why you juxtapose a character like Toph and Katara who is all serious. She's not very girly. They make a serious point of that in the entire show too. Like there's a whole episode where Katara and Toph literally go get makeovers at the spa 
god she's like this is just like not my thing but I do love spending time with you and there's like a whole point to be made in the show about how you can be girly and you can also fight at the same time but you also don't have to do those things none of those things makes you less of a woman or less of a girl or less of a good fighter and that's like such a core part of the story for the women in this story and such a core part of Katara's character as well. Like she is allowed to be extremely feminine, extremely mothering and motherly in very traditionally feminine ways and still be an incredible fighter. It doesn't make her any less powerful. And I feel like that's what they're kind of implying by saying that they want to tone that down. Again, that's actual sexism, that's actual misogyny, not Sokka's character arc in the original series. And then we have to get to the thing that really just pushed me over the edge absolutely pushed me over the edge. And that's the fact that they want to cut all of these things from the show, they want to tone all of these things down in the show that, in my opinion, are essential, as I've made clear. But do you want to know what they do want to depict, what they do want to show us, what they want to add in? The genocide of the air nomads. Yeah. Absolutely unsurprising. <laughs> I'm so pissed. <laughs> I just cannot believe, I can believe, I can fully believe, but I can't believe that you would watch a show like this and your takeaway would be, you know what we need? We need to show the literal violence, the literal genocide, the actual violence of it. You need to see all of it. But we're gonna take out the other lighthearted, fun, hopeful, heartfelt moments of this show because it's not as essential, but you do need to see that violence enacted. That is Hollywood at its core, in my opinion, and I think it's extremely detrimental, completely unsurprising, but also so devastating, so upsetting. I'm so angry. <laughs> the thing about this that really pisses me off is, first of all, I think there's a very deliberate reason why the genocide of the Air Nomads is not shown in the original show, and it's not because it's just a kid's show, because that show has a lot of violence, and I do not think that they didn't show that because it would have been too much. I think they didn't show it because that scene of seeing Monkey Yatso's skeleton in that room when Aang finds him for the first time, seeing his skeleton there, that scene is so much more devastating than any of the other violence they could have shown. You don't need to see that in order to feel the pain that Aang feels in that moment. And in my opinion, this is the epitome of good versus bad writing. If you have to show people the head-on, direct, deliberate violence, like right in front of their faces in order for them to care about something happening, that's just lazy writing. And it's not just like the writing element of it. You shouldn't have to watch extreme gore and violence in order to care about what has happened to somebody or a group of people. And yes, what I'm talking about directly relates to the world news and the literal genocide we're also watching. This is a direct reflection of that exact same situation and why so many people cannot seem to come to terms with real life genocide, it's because we feel like we have to watch this kind of violence right in front of our eyes in order to care. And even then, people barely care. That's the problem. You should not have to watch it directly in order to care just as much. It's like the same thing as when people only care about what happens to groups of people in their own community and don't care about what's happening to other people who are different from them. There are times when putting yourself directly in someone's shoes helps and it's relevant, but this is not one of those times. And the show, the original show, chose not to show it that way so intentionally, so intentionally, in a way that made it even more devastating. And the fact that that's what they want to add in. Oh my god, I'm so angry. <laughs> like the quote they have from this one is, the animated show is a cartoon, it's meant for kids, but I felt it was important that we see the event that creates the story of Avatar. The famous line is, everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. I wanted to see that. We don't need to see it. We get it, okay? Like I just, oh my god. Oh my god. I'm so serious. Like, this is the death of writing. The writing is dead. It's dead. <laughs> the children's TV show from 2005 did such a better job of giving you a nuanced depiction of all of the themes of this story than this live action version will ever give us. And all of these quotes that are coming out make that so evident. It's not going to be even half as nuanced as the original, half as well written. Based on what's coming out of this, they don't even understand the point of the original show. I saw another article where they were saying like, because this is like a children's show, we wanted to appeal to like the original fans since it's so well loved. We want OG fans to come back in and enjoy it, but we also want to appeal to new fans, people who are fans of things like, and I quote, Game of Thrones. I... <laughs> if you think 
that Avatar The Last Airbender needs to be compared to something like Game of Thrones, we've lost the plot. We have lost the plot completely. What do you mean Game of Thrones fans? What are you gonna have Aang do? Probably they're gonna have him kill Ozai and they're also probably gonna have him like burn down the entire Fire Nation or something like that a la Daenerys Targaryen. Again, I reiterate my question for the thousandth time. Did you watch the original show? The Western world's fascination with watching violence is just so unbelievably detrimental to us all. I just don't understand how you could take something that was never about the violence. It was never about watching the direct violence. It was always about the repercussions of that violence. That's the whole conflict Aang is struggling with for the entire series. I just feel like I'm going completely crazy. I'm so frustrated and I'm so, so worried. Anyway, those are pretty much my thoughts on all of this Avatar The Last Airbender TV series news. I have so many feelings about this. I am so, so worried, but I am still optimistic. Like I'm still gonna watch it. I want to like it. It's not like I don't wanna like it. I want to, I want to love it. I just have a really strong feeling that I won't. And after reading all of these articles, I fully understand why the original creators left mid-production, because I would have too. If there's any more news or anything that comes out um, by the time I post this video, let me know in the comments down below. Let's discuss all of your thoughts. I plan to watch the entire series, like I said, and I plan to do reviews for every single episode as they air. So if you're interested in watching that, let me know, because I really do want to make them. I'll make them anyway, but it would be nice to know that you're all interested too. But that is it for this video. If you'd like to follow me on any of my social media to talk about all things Avatar or anything else as well, all my links are in the description box as always. But thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and Appa and I, well, maybe not Appa. He won't be with me next time unless we're watching Avatar. When we're watching Avatar, he'll be back with me. But I will see you very soon in my next video. Bye.